and uh, it's just great to see everybody. Let's just open our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day and this opportunity of meeting together in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for one another, your church here in Merlin's Bridge, scattered around and viewing in today. Lord, may we know your presence, the power of your Holy Spirit, and may we have open hearts to the love of Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, Robin's going to leave, uh, not leave us, lead us this morning in worship. So it's over to Robin. Thank you. Lovely to see you all this morning. Um, this week, uh, I don't know, I know we're all kind of getting used to feeling a bit out of control with different aspects of our lives, aren't we? Um, this week, something came up that I felt really particularly sort of powerless in. And once I'd done what I could do, um, I then just fretted about it for a bit, <laughs> as we often do. Um, but I don't think it was an accident that this week a school asked me to do an assembly on mountains um, because that's the topic for their term. And so I immediately thought of Psalm 121. So I've spent three days kind of in Psalm 121 and it didn't really, you know, sometimes I think <laughs> the Lord is trying to speak to us, but we're too wrapped up in our little worries and things we're concerned about. Um, so it took, it, it took the three days, I think, of doing the assembly to, to realise that he was just saying to me, lift up your eyes. I'm your helper. And so I'm going to read it out um, this morning for anyone else who might just need to remember that too. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. And we're going to sing, and I, I have cheated this morning, we're going to use um, YouTube uh, song, <laughs> but we're going to um, sing together, you can sing from home. Oh Lord my God, um, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand have made. So I'll just share my screen now. Oh Lord my God. When I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand hath made, I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy path throughout. Sings my soul
Bible series that we're doing there's um, a beautiful prayer for today and I thought maybe we could read it together so I'm going to hopefully get that up on the screen as well and we can read it together um, where you are this morning so I'll read it out and you can read it at home almighty creator God we thank you for your glorious and wonderful creation that we see all around us help us to notice what you are doing and to see you in all things. We give you thanks for all you have done and for all you are doing. Thank you, Lord, that you have made each one of us in your own image. You have created our inmost being and have knit us together in our mother's womb. You know our innermost thoughts and know every hair on our head, yet you st still you love us. We are sorry for those times we ignore that or decide to go our own way. Help us to honour you as our creator, our helper and advocate. Jesus, we ask for your forgiveness and restoration. Spirit, we thank you for being with us, for filling us afresh, for bringing new life. Help us to live in the certainty of hope and of your promise that you will never leave us. Thank you, Lord, that you never give up on us. We bring you all honour, glory and praise. Amen. And let's sing together, the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. I will trust in you alone. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust in you. And I will trust in you. Your endless mercy follows me. 
Father, we do thank you for the songs we've been listening to and joining in at home. We thank you, Father, for the stillness and the quiet waters of life, life in the Lord Jesus Christ, the good shepherd of the sheep. And Father, we thank and praise you that through him, he is the good shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. And Father, we thank you for the one who cares for us, looks after us, fills us with his joy, forgives us of our sins, and we praise you for his presence with us in our lives and today as we meet together in church. We thank you that through you, Lord, is wonderful salvation. The old has gone and the new has come to all who repent and turn to you. We thank you that you've promised life to the full and we thank you that the good shepherd knows his sheep by name we're all precious to you lord and we thank you father that as we love christ we can share his love with others other sheep i have and father we open our hearts to you for all of those who we know around the country and around the world who love and follow you we thank you, Father, for all the different expressions of faith. But we know there's only one flock and one shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for your church here in Emmanuel, reminded by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians that there are those who are prophets, 
apostles, evangelists, pastors, teachers and works of service in the church. And Father, as we grow together in the Lord Jesus Christ and as we open our hearts to the big picture of the Bible, help us to know and experience in our own church here in Emmanuel the gifts that God has given to those who are all belonging here. We thank you for the gifts that God has given to his church. Everyone is precious and everyone has something to contribute. We remember in our hurting world today, for those who are fearful, anxious, worried, frustrated, afraid, bereaved. And we pray, Lord, it's a big prayer through your church. We pray, Lord, all through our local areas. And we pray, Father, for your peace, that people may turn to the living Lord Jesus. May they know his peace and love within their hearts and within their lives. We pray, Lord, for those involved in business. For some, Lord, many businesses has gone down. For others who are self-employed, they've lost employment. And we do pray, Lord, for all in that category that you would help them. We thank you, Father, for those who are on furlough, may have a time of rest and still be supported, and we ask your blessing upon them. We pray, Lord, for all those who have to travel, and we pray that you will keep them safe, and especially those who are running ambulances and everything else to bring people into hospital. We do pray, Lord, this morning for the governments of the world, and we think particularly of all that's happened in the United States. We pray for Joe Biden, Lord, as he leads the country. We thank you for the reforms he's already made. And we pray, Lord, for Donald Trump, how he must be feeling this morning, we just don't know. Help him to see himself as the Lord sees him. We pray, Lord, and continue to pray for the National Health Service, tired, exhausted, people going sick through the strain of it all. And we do remember from our own church, all of those who serve you in the caring and also in the National Health Service here locally. We pray for doctors, nurses and all who serve you in these ways and all the carers. And we pray that you will encourage and help them. We thank you, Father, for your love and goodness to us. We pray for those who have a heart for different nations of the world. We thank you in our prayer meeting for two represent China. And we pray, Lord Jesus, for the church in China this morning. May you equip them and help them and encourage them. We pray for Robin's friend in Cameroon. We ask your blessing upon her and her colleagues as they are translating the Bible. And Lord, we pray your blessing upon them and strength. We think of those in Holland that we know and love. And we pray for all as we think about them and remember them in our prayers. We pray for those in Italy. And we thank you, Father, that we're able to bring them in prayer on a Wednesday night. We pray for those in Singapore who love the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Father just for your goodness and love to those who love you and all of those around. And we thank you, Father, for the Christian assemblies going out into schools. May they be a blessing to the teachers and also for the staff. Father, it is your world and you died for the world and help us in our daily lives, in phone calls, emails, and all the ways that we can share the love of Christ through the church and through ourselves to the people we engage with over the week. We thank you for your graciousness and goodness. And I pray, Lord, for all who are here on the Zoom this morning and maybe listen to it after. May each know the burden bearer Jesus. May we cast our cares upon him and know his peace and his joy. And so shall we say together the Lord's Prayer, and we'll say the traditional uh, Lord's Prayer this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Right, now we're going to have a testimony from the Bible Society's website. From a young age, I just loved spending time in nature and being in the outdoors. My parents, they also loved it, and they used to take me to Snowdonia and the Lake District. I remember, maybe I was about six, looking up from the car window and seeing the ridges of Blencathra up high above me, so sort of narrow and sculpted, and they were inviting me up there. I could feel my heart beating, and I just knew I needed to get outside and get into, get into the mountains. I grew up in Shropshire, and that meant there was no shortage of hills and valleys, countryside to explore. And when I'd be out there, I'd often think, there must be something behind this beauty. There must be some sort of creator. And even more than that, it dawned on me that there must be something that makes my heart resonate and feel like this. As a teenager, I had no idea about faith or Christianity. To me, that was just outdated thinking. And yet, every time I was out in nature, I felt strangely compelled to believe, to consider that maybe there was actually a God, and even to pray to him sometimes. So I decided it'd be a good idea to go to university, study geography and biology. And it was there that I met Christians who were really open and bold about their faith. And they seemed intelligent enough. And that got me thinking, well, maybe I should be a bit more open-minded about things. So my love of the outdoors just continued to grow and I would be off hiking and running. And I remember one evening in Shropshire, just lying on top of a hill, calling out to God, look, if you're there, would you make yourself known to me? So I started going along to church with some of my friends from university, and I realized I didn't have all the answers. Maybe I needed to humble myself before this God who I was starting to recognize was the creator of everything. And then one day at church, I felt compelled to kneel down before God. I was overcome with emotion. There were tears rolling down my cheeks. And the name of Jesus that once had meant nothing to me suddenly realized it was a name of power and beauty, the same power and beauty that had spoken to me since I was a child. And from that moment, it's been amazing to be in a daily relationship with the same God, the one not only created the whole universe, but he also created me. And what a joy. Although this is my story, I don't know anybody who doesn't marvel at a sunset or feel humbled by the power of the ocean. And that makes me think God is communicating with everyone, calling them graciously to himself if they would listen. It's great to hear a testimony, isn't it? And uh, there are people who are considering coming into membership in the church. And at some point, it would be great to hear their testimony too. But now we're going to hear the Bible reading from Steve. Okay, today's reading is from uh, Genesis chapter 1, uh, starting at verse 1 and reading through to chapter 2, verse 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was ev evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it, and it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place, 
and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so, the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the light, the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the great light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created great creatures of the sea and every living thing uh, with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to its kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be you yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it. I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Thank you, Steve. It's lovely just to hear that passage of scripture and praise God for it, the beginnings, isn't it? And now it's over to Daniel. He's going to bring God's word to our hearts today. This is the six-beat, six-piece scripture story. This is the overarching rescue story. This is part one of the better story. Flip back to the beginning, to the original origin, the maker magnificently moulding matter into motion and meaning into being right at the start. 
The original orator orchestrated order, opened his mouth and words became worlds. The perfect poet punctuated planets with purpose, set out solar systems with his stanzas. Creatively composing creation so dramatically, with creation singing his glory so harmoniously. The world was gloriously conditioned in mint, royally sealed by the king, stamped with his fingerprint. And from the dust he formed us, Adam from the earth and from Adam's rib made Eve live. Man and woman at the summit of God's place, becoming the ultimate reflection of perfection, image bearers of God's beauty and loving community. Whilst the tree of life breathed in the backdrop so breathtakingly, God strolled with his people in the cool shade so intimately. Until the snake until the cataclysmic mistake with a serpent spoiling the truth and speaking the fake news knowledge misused the origins of love and trust abused adam and eve see their shame and try to mask it up their guilt hid behind leaves it's the first ever cover-up a relationship severed as sin enters stage left and banished from the garden adam and eve left and sin goes viral heartbroken god calls noah to build an ark to ride out the rain as god hits restart the flood sweeps away evil's rain and as the water recedes one thing remains a color spectrum rainbow vow never again. And though we're stained with sin's original curse, we can find our origin in the image of the one we reflected first. We can find healing in the promise of Genesis 3.15, that what was smeared in sin will one day be clean, where the raucous chant of evil gets hushed, as the seed's heel gets bruised, but the serpent's head gets crushed. Fantastic. It's great to hear the story as story, isn't it? I love those. And there'll be one of those every week that tells us the next bit of the journey that we're on. Um, I don't know about you. I love origin stories. Um, I love movies that tell the backstory or a book that tells the backstory of the characters that I've watched or loved or grown to love. Have you ever wondered why Darcy is so miserable? Why is he so proud? What gets him to that place of being so proud and arrogant and unfeeling? What was in his backstory that meant that became a reality? Maybe kids, you've watched The Lion King. Have you ever wondered where Scar gets the scar from? Why is he so evil? Why does he hate Mufasa so much? Was it something that happened when they were kids? Did his brother accidentally maim him? What was his backstory? When we understand someone's backstory, we begin to understand a, a little bit about what makes them tick, why they are the way they are, and it begins to make sense of them. If, if I was to tell you that I hate wearing the color bright red, you'd think I was being a little bit bats. But if I explain the backstory, that when I was a child, my parents made me wear a bright red raincoat with all of my other family. And wherever we went, we were like this sea of red. You might begin to understand why I hate wearing bright red. The backstory explains a little bit about who I am. And sometimes Hollywood tries to explain those backstories, doesn't it? And as with the Star Wars prequels, we're left disappointed by the explanation. We don't think it really fully explains the reality that we're living in. 
that's true for us and it's true for the whole of humanity. We wonder sometimes, why is it that we are outraged by people like when, when Lord Sumption this week said that some people are more valuable than others, why does that make us feel so angry? What is it about our origins that means that that is the case? Why do we get behind campaigns like Black Lives Matter? Why do we support Me Too? Why do we hate human trafficking? Why do we support human rights? Why do we fight for justice, try and expose liars, make sure that people who abuse power pay for it? Why, when we watch a David Attenborough documentary and we see species dying, does it hurt so much? Why is it when we read about plastic bags at the very deepest part of the ocean, does it stir something within us? Why, why do we admire beauty? Why does some of us love gardening? I mean, that one's still a mystery to me, to be honest, but some of us love gardening. Why is it we like to create new food, new music, new art, new literature, new technology? Why do we love to create things? Is it because our world came about by some giant cosmic accident, some fluke explosion where we're all kind of merely here by chance? Is that the origin story that best explains the values that we hold dear? Is it because we came about through a gradual process of the strong overcoming the weak so that those who had good characteristics were selected and those that weren't were just left to rot and die? Does that, does that best explain the situation we find ourselves in, the values that we really hold dear today? Because I, I think if those origin stories are true, we actually end up with a really, really different world from the one we live in. If we're just a mistake, if the strong should always overcome the weak, then when people are mistreated, when they're abused, when they're, when they're uh, enslaved or discriminated against, if we're just an accident, we should just say, mm, so what? You know, it's just a case of natural selection, the powerful overcoming the weak. If, if someone gets sick, if, if those worldviews are correct, then we should just let them die. We should do what Scrooge says in A Christmas Carol. You know, if they'd rather die, then let them die and reduce the surplus population. Because after all, they're just weak. They're just taking up space. We should just get rid of them if that worldview is correct. Food should just be functional to us, shouldn't it? It shouldn't be something we enjoy. It should just be fueled to get us through the day. Uh, music and art, waste of space, no point to it. The environment becomes something we should pillage to get what we need because we should do whatever it is that we think we should do. And, and when people abuse power, we shouldn't try and bring them to justice. Actually, we should hold them aloft. We should celebrate them as the pinnacle of what it means to be the survivors, the fittest, the strongest in every way. And yet none of us, no one in the whole world believes those things, do they? None of us think those are values that we should build our lives on. We react in a kind of anger and a rage about those things because we know that's not who we really are. And so those origin stories don't really best explain who we are, why we're here, because they're not our story. They are not our story. In the Bible, in Genesis chapter one, we get to read our origin story. We get to hear the prequel, the prologue, the backstory of all human existence. And we often get in a muddle when it comes to Genesis because we come to it a bit like a scientific textbook and we try and unpack it and we get ourselves in a muddle about, you know, how long it took and which day came in which order and how does that match the geological record and where the dinosaurs fit in. And we get in all these signs of things. And, and sometimes when we come to it like a scientific textbook, we can end up thinking that that science and the Bible are actually fighting one another. When in reality, the Bible was never meant to be a scientific textbook. The original author did not write it in that way. We get a hint of that in the fact that out of the whole Bible, we get two chapters to teach us how God made the entire universe. I mean, that's not entirely a comprehensive manual. It is two chapters. And in fact, we get one verse to describe how God made over 100 billion stars just in our galaxy alone. In Genesis 1.16, it just says, oh, and he also made the stars. Just a throwaway comment, not a blow-by-blow blow account, a throwaway comment that speaks this broad brushstroke of what God has done. And then there's the fact that when we look at Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and I'd encourage you to read the whole account through to Genesis 3 after we finish this morning, the, the order doesn't quite match up. So in Genesis 1, 
we get the order of water, land, plants, animals, humans. In Genesis 2, we get the order land, water, humans, plants, animals, woman. So the order's different. At least one of those chapters has to be ordering the creation account poetically or ordering it to make a point. And that doesn't mean it's false. If I was to read a biography and they started at the end of someone's life or in the middle, I wouldn't think they were making it up. I just think they were ordering the account in order to make a particular point. And that's what the author of Genesis is doing. And so in the passage Steve read, we read this structure, don't we? In day one, God separates light from darkness. And in day four, he fills the night sky with stars and the moon and the daytime is dominated by the sun, the greater light. In day two, he separates waters above from waters below. In day five, birds fill the waters above the sky and fish fill the seas. And then in day three, he separates the earth from the sea. Uh, day three, sorry, he separates the earth from the sea. And in day six, he fills that sphere. He fills the earth with animals and with humans to rule over the animals. He's trying to make a point, a point that God is creating and shaping and designing a world that is fit for humans to live in. A world that is designed and created with us in mind, where he can dwell with his people. Science and the Bible are not answering the same questions. Um, I remember a medical definition that was described at my best man's wedding. It's this, see if you can figure out what this is a definition of. The anatomical juxtaposition of two orbicularis oris muscles in a state of contraction. What does that describe? I'm looking to see if Rob Jones knows. It describes a, a kiss. That is a kiss. And yet we all know that is about the un, most unromantic, undescriptive uh, description of a kiss you could possibly imagine. It might describe how a kiss happens, but it doesn't explain why I might kiss someone. It doesn't explain why I might kiss Barney when he's fallen over or greet a friend with a kiss or have a passionate kiss or a, a lingering goodbye kiss. It doesn't describe the relationship that exists. And in a similar way, science can explain how things happen, but the Bible explains why. Genesis explains why, it explains the relationship and how these things came about. Genesis wasn't written to pick a fight, it wasn't written to be a blow by blow account into a world of lots of origin stories. It was written to correct and to prove and to declare the truth, a true origin story about how the world came to be. And so we see the writer do this in the account. All the other accounts are describing how many gods created the world. Many gods who were kind of existing alongside the creation. And in Genesis, the author goes, no. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, there was no one but God. He's separate. He's distinct from the creation. And he just spoke. The one God spoke and creation came into existence. And then into a world that says this was just some kind of cosmic accident caused by gods that were at war with one another. In Genesis 1 verse 2, we see God not at war, but resting, hovering over the waters. And in Genesis 3, it's clear this isn't an accident. God, does, God doesn't go, oh, whoops, I made something. He says, let there be light. He intentionally desires to create the world. And so that's exactly what he does. And then into the other stories that would say, well, the world is just a disgusting consequence of violence. They believed in some Babylonian stories that, that the earth was the slain body of the goddess Tiamat. And so that the earth was the slain body and the sky was the other half of the body. And so they thought the earth was just a disgusting consequence of this God that had been slaughtered. And Genesis says, no, that's not true. Creation isn't disgusting. It's good. Time and time again, God says, doesn't he? It was good. God saw it was good. Verse 31 says, God saw it was very good. This is a creation that is desired, that is designed, that is born out of the love of the Father, the love of the Son, the Word of God, who speaks creation into existence, the love of the, the, love of the Spirit who broods over the waters. This is a creation of a love that is cared for and is longed for, not a disgusting consequence of violence. And then those other stories spoke about humanity in a similar way to the other origin stories in our society speak about humanity. So humanity was considered 
weak and worthless. They were God slaves or God food. That's how they were considered. And at the climax of the Genesis account, we get this in, in Genesis 1, 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And so the writer of Genesis, God himself, breathing through the writer, is teaching them, teaching us a few things about who we are. Firstly, that humans have value and significance. Every human life has value and significance because it is made in the image of God. We're created to live in relationship with each other and with God and with the world. We're precious, special and valuable to God. In chapter two, verse seven, God breathes intimately into Adam's nostrils. He shapes the whole world to make it fit for human habitation. He gives us a purpose in verse 28 to be fruitful and increase in number, to fill the earth and subdue it and to rule. So he gives us a creative purpose. Just as he has created, we are to create, to create children, to create music, to create art, to create technology, to, to rule, to steward on God's behalf this good world that he's made. And then he provides for them. He provides food. He provides in chapter two, a place, a beautiful place for them to live. And when all the other accounts were talking about enslaved um, humans by the gods here in Genesis, what does God do in chapter two, verse 16? He says to them, you are free. God gives them freedom. They're not enslaved to follow him. They are free to choose whether they will respond to him or not. This story explains our origins, doesn't it? It explains why we all believe what we believe, that, that every human life is precious and valuable and has significance because we're not an accident. It's not some people who are weak being dominated by the strong. Everyone is made in the image of God who loves them. Creation matters, the environment matters, the world matters, because it's not disgusting, it's good, and we were called to care for it, to see it flourish. Creativity and freedom and justice and beauty and family are values that we all cherish and share, because they're things that God has built into us as humans. We were designed to live together, to be creative, to be free. We and the whole world were made beautiful. We were made beautiful. But the Bible doesn't stop there because it explains why we don't actually experience that, do we? We long for it, but we don't always experience that beauty. And so in Genesis 3, as we heard at the end of this spoken word, we read how the whole creation is broken as mankind, men and women, Adam and Eve, choose to turn from brokenness uh, from beauty to brokenness and the result is whereas before they were naked and unashamed now they hide from one another and turn from God whereas before they work together to rule now they fight against each other blame each other and try and rule over one another whereas before they worked together with creation to see it flourish now creation and mankind are at war There'll be struggle, there'll be hardship, relationships will break down because they're separated from the God of life and love and beauty. Genesis matches our experience. We're beautiful and yet we're broken. And it explains why it is we don't just accept that. Oh, well, we're just a cosmic accident. This is the life I was given. It's why we long for something more. Robin mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the repair shop. Uh, I've never actually seen it, but I read an article on it because that's the kind of person I am from Radio Times over Christmas. And it was it just really touched my heart. I'll send it later. It's a fantastic article. I watched a little clip of the repair shop and they missed a the crucial bit out. But but in this episode, a vicar brought in his uh, his daughter's battered rocking horse to be fixed. And his, his daughter was called Tamsin, and she had tragically died just before her eighth birthday at Christmas time. And they bought her this, this uh, secondhand rocking horse that was a bit battered, a bit faded, a bit chipped. But when she opened that rocking horse, she didn't look at it and go, oh, it's broken. Oh, it's battered, it's bruised, it's awful. Instead, he said she flung her arms around this horse and she just declared in this voice, my beauty, my beauty my love, 
love, love. To her, though the horse was battered and broken and bruised, she saw what it had been designed for. She loved it because it belonged to her. It was beautiful and it was loved. And you know, so often we can feel battered and bruised and broken, can't we? In our lives, in our world. And yet God sees us in the same way this morning. He sees you in the same way this morning. He loves you and he cares for you. And he thinks that you are beautiful. Maybe, maybe you've always been told that you're a failure, that you've never quite measured up to your parents' expectations or the expectations of your family. Or you've, you feel like you're always the one that lets everyone down. When something can go wrong, it's you that's blamed. Maybe you've had someone walk out on you. You know, someone has left you, someone in the past, someone in the present. Maybe they've left you emotionally and, and you're, you're still there, but you feel emotionally distant, maybe in your family or even in your relationship. And it, it just really hurts and it makes you feel broken and it makes you feel like you're not truly whole. Maybe something happened in your past that's left you hurting, that has broken your relationship with other people that has damaged you in some way and you feel like it will always dominate it will always dictate it will always trap your life you're broken you're battered or bruised we all are we've either been battered by someone else or we are the ones who have hurt other people by our sin and our selfishness and yet this morning However chipped, however broken, however faded, God looks at you. He looks at me. And he doesn't turn away from us. He doesn't shun us. He doesn't say, well, I'm going to throw them on the refuse pile. Instead, he flings his arm around us and he says, my beauty, my beauty, my love, love, love. Not, not because you've got it all together, not because you are beautiful, but because although we've all turned away from him, although we've all sinned and fallen short of his glory, although we've all chosen brokenness over beauty, God always seeks to draw close to us. He always moves towards us in love. He created out of love. He moves towards us in love. In Genesis 3.15, we get the first hint of that in the Bible. That beautiful promise that one day an offspring will come, an offspring of the woman who will crush the enemy, crush Satan, crush death, crush pain, crush suffering. And he will defeat it so that we can be free. And, and we know, don't we, as we read that one story of scripture, that in Jesus, we have the fulfillment of that promise. In Jesus, the descendant of Adam and Eve, we have one who would crush the serpent's head, crush our death, our darkness, become our brokenness so that we could know his beauty filling our lives, rising again to defeat it so that we could know him at work in our lives today and receive his new life. In the repair shop, they set to work. They set to work on that horse and they, they gradually and lovingly restored the paint. And they sanded down the chips and they repaired the broken nose and they renewed what had been lost. They replaced the saddle. And on the base of the rockers, they engraved that wonderful phrase, my beauty, my beauty, my love, love, love. And Steve the Vicar said in that moment when we saw that horse restored, we got to see what Tamsin had seen and what Tamsin had declared all those years before. You know, the same can be true for you and for me today. Jesus invites us to his repair shop. He invites us to his repair shop to come just as we are. We've been broken by our sin and by the sin of others. We're called beautiful by the God who made us and designed us and who loved us. And we can be made new as we respond to Jesus, open our lives to him, turn from our sin and our selfishness and accept the gift that he offers. Maybe, maybe you despair of that. Maybe you think there is no way I can ever truly be restored. There's no way I'll ever truly be healed. Maybe you're fed up of the battle with sin. You're constantly struggling with the way that you hurt other people 
or things that you're wrestling with in your life right now and you think, I will never know that chip knocked out. I will never know that faded paint restored. I'm too battered. I'm too bruised. And yet the promise of Jesus for each of us who have responded to him is this. We read it in 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all, not those who have got it together, not those who are walking right, we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed. He is changing us. He is renewing us into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Day by day, the Lord Jesus Christ, if you know him, if you love him, is restoring that paintwork. He's replacing that saddle. He's repairing that muzzle until you become who he created you to be. And one day we'll see things, we'll see ourselves the way God sees us and declares us to be now, restored to wholeness and beauty again. Revelation 21 verse 5, behold, I am making all things new. This is our story. It's our backstory. It's our origin story. We can celebrate it. We can thank God for it. We can look to it to give us meaning and to give us hope. We are beautiful. We are broken, but we are being made new. And I wonder this morning, will you allow Jesus to restore you? Will you walk into the repair shop and allow him to work in your life and your heart and become what you were created to be? We're going to open our hearts to Jesus now as we open a song and and we're going to have a moment just to respond to that origin story, to what we've heard, that we're broken, we're beautiful, but we're being made new. And this is just a moment. This song has touched my heart all week. It's a moment to ask the Holy Spirit, would you do something in me? Would you continue to be at work in my life? I open myself. I walk into that repair shop and ask that you would continue to restore me and continue to make me new. If if you've never given your life to Jesus, this is an opportunity to say, God, I need you. I want you in my life. I turn from my sin and my selfishness to you who alone can make me new. Thank you for dying for me, rising for me and for loving for me. Come into my life and make me new. So I just invite you to open your hands to God now. If you want to receive from him, uh, just in your homes, just open your hands in front if you like this. And I'm just going to pray a prayer and then we're going to watch this video as we respond to God together. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you created us to be beautiful. We're made in your image. We're sorry for the times when we forget to see that in others or in ourselves. We thank you that though we've turned from you, you still love us. And we confess that we have turned, that we've chosen brokenness over beauty, that we've lived sinful, selfish lives. We're sorry. We thank you that in Jesus you died and rose again and ascended into heaven so that we could know your beauty being restored in us. Please, by your Holy Spirit, in these moments now, fill us again so that we might become who you've created us to be. Holy Spirit, we pray, fill us and restore us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Listen to a thousand tongues But there is one that sounds above them all The Father's song, the Father's love You sung it over me and for eternity It's written on my heart perfect melody the creator's symphony you are singing over me the father's song heaven's perfect mystery the king of love has sent for me and now you're singing over me 
Let us come together in prayer. Father, we thank you for our service this morning. We thank you for the exposition of your word. We thank you for all the truth in it, Lord. And we are reminded in the scriptures that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And we thank you, Lord, for that wonderful theme of restoration. Every day we open our hearts to you, seek your face and walk in new life. We're reminded, Lord, by the writer to the Hebrews, now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be all glory for ever and ever. Amen. 